<laughs> I have to deal with you. Mount Everest ain't got shit on me. You know what's crazy is that no matter what happens, oh, I don't care. we have a baby. Oh, oh I don't care. <laughs> Unless go, go the ahead. baby tragically dies, we will always have to be like connected with each other, like no matter what happens. You say that's crazy or that's a good thing? I said it's just a reality. Whether it's a good thing, we'll, we'll find out. It's the future I can see. Legs and hips and body, body, body. Listeners, hey, listeners. And a special hey, hi, hello, bonjour to all of you patrons out there. Amber, what's a patron? Well, I'll tell you. It's someone who has decided, who has chosen to love on us through their dollars. Maybe one dollar, maybe three dollar, maybe five dollars a month. Patrons are lovely people who found a link and said, I want to support the Wallen family. I want to support the side by side. And if you're asking, Amber, can I, me, be a patron? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. So check out that Patreon link. It is in the show notes if you would like to keep supporting. Um, special shout out to a couple patrons. We're keeping it rocking. McKenna, Brittany, Karina, Akela, Ginty, Kimberly, Bria, Ashley, Keisha, and Camille. Also, we do a book giveaway for patrons. We will be giving away the book. Damn, I forgot just that quick. What book are we giving away next? Queen of Bad Dreams. The Queen, one we discussed the one, last week. Ooh! What would, what would I be without my baby? Yeah. So what are you giving away? Quit. You know who wrote that song? Who sings that song? I should sing it. How they sing it? What would I be without my baby? Baby. baby. Cause every girl needs a lady. Lady. I mean, that's fine that you're repeating after you, but you know who sang it. He, has he passed away? No. Okay, let's keep. <laughs> Uh, patrons, each month we do a bookly, bookly, I, I'm sorry, I can't cut through it. We do a monthly book giveaway and we do this little random wheel spinning thing. So you will be randomly chosen for this book. Now let's get started with the show. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Side under the Believe Podcast Network. It is indeed a podcast about black science fiction, black fantasy, and staying on the same page of this family. Today is episode 87. Hello, those of you watching um, on the YouTube. My tits look amazing. I'm breastfeeding, so they're they're flourishing this time in the morning. Um, I just caught a glimpse of that. But anyway, this week we'll be discussing Electric Arches by Eve L. Ewing. There will be spoilers. This is a book of poetry. What, what's wrong? Is it yeah. Ewing or Ewing? No, no. Can it's like you Patrick Ewing. It's sort of just funny that you give a spoiler alert for poems. It's like it's written. Well, it's written in free verse. It is written in free verse, but <laughs> oh, just in no. case. But just in case. So, okay, so so you can't. So okay, let, let let's get into something really quickly because I I'm not well versed on spoilers, but I remember the first time I got dragged on TikTok is because I spoiled well, the video game. Well versed. Well versed. Versed. Well versed. I'm not free versed. Didn't sh- because there's of the a says. pun in there. Listen, so okay, so what can be spoiled? Movies, video games, and a book of poetry. I, why? Why is it funny that that can be spoiled? I don't think a book of poetry can be spoiled, but there poetry. are there is a uh, some short stories in here that could be spoiled. Why can I, Why can't poetry be spoiled? Because they're not. I mean, unless it's narrative poetry. Like if you were, I don't know, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight or something. So anything that involves storytelling is a spoiler alert. I think so, yeah. Ah, which is why I was unaware because I don't play video games of the storytelling aspect. Right, yeah. Gotti. Oh, okay, yeah. I you, remember that. Yeah, yeah, like the ending of Zelda, you know, Majora's Mask or something like that would be a spoiler, which I would not spoil. Everyone should go download all those ocarina of time and play those games anyway yeah but there are element there are things here that could be spoiled and other things that can't be spoiled in this book of poetry speaking of spoiled um ben dropped i filled up a thing of breast milk this morning and ben dropped the whole thing so it was first we we had to we are recording the podcast a little late because uh i was upset you, you were upset for many reasons. Yeah. You I, literally cried over spilt milk. I did not cry. You 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 like to say I did you because of the, the idiom. You cried out. I was 
rightfully so annoyed because it takes a while to yeah. hand express and this pump a, and do all the things right. that my body's, uh, you know, a, a, a human milkshake. So you dropped my milk. This might be the only time, in the bed. <laughs> the only time where someone has the justification to cry over spilt milk when it's breast milk that you have to push out and you know that shit is literally dope. you have you have iron deficiency because you're breastfeeding so right. i think you're and justified you just, in crying over spilt milk in this case. ass just dropped it what else were you mad about me today <laughs> oh yeah can't so, remember oh ben oh, yeah. was ben is very disorganized with his That's calendar so i, I booked the yoga true. class and he's like wait i have a business appointment that time so i re, you know we have a child so we have to coordinate so then i canceled my yoga class he was like actually my dentist appointment is for tomorrow and then i was like well that's a conflict as well because i asked you also could i get my nails done tomorrow at that mm -hmm. time and you said yep that that time's available so he's just an idiot is what we're getting at and so i guess we'll start the show <laughs> you know something Explain that why something you're so about you and you never had an agenda growing up because you were homeschooled home maybe that's yeah, why that could be it i did have it in my calendar i just had put it in the wrong day or i might have put it in the right day but then the text message I got from the dentist appointment said a different day. And I think because of the Memorial Day weekend, there could have been a switch up. But something that... Me, no, you've me, been disorganized since day one. Yes, but I've gotten better because of your support. But something that me and your mom do talk a lot about when we talk about you is that you have this ability <laughs> to sort of just mull over things. Like something like changing an appointment. It's not a big deal to switch things around on a calendar, especially if you have enough days. But... You'll get annoyed and it will last 40, 50, 60 minutes of your life. And so this morning I was like, you're wasting your life having this stuff, you know, haunt you when it's just a switch of the calendars. You do. So I can speak. So I can. So I can. But something me and your mom discuss in, in I, depth about. I, and I, oh, don't I love when you and my mom just talk shit about me behind my back. But here's the thing about it, Bear. I get to be upset about things and here's the reality i only be upset for like five or six minutes if you would just leave me alone for those five or six minutes you would have a good day but what you do is you come and you're like yeah i might be disorganized but there's no reason why you should be upset about that because you're wasting your life being upset and that's what gets me more elevated I think I, the, my so first thing. So just leave me alone. If I'm upset about something where you drop the ball, I promise you, I really, I don't even have it in my spirit to be mad past 10 minutes, especially for a small offense like a calendar switch. I wish up. you could clone yourself you, and live with yourself for a day. And then and I've lived alone before. It's great. It's fabulous. I wish maybe, you know what we should do is like you download your consciousness into right. my mind. But like you don't have access to my mind. It's almost like that Black Mirror episode where you have that little people, you know, at the end of uh, I think it was like. Well, you know what's going to happen. Wild is going to tell us all of our issues as we yeah. get older. So. But we can practice you telling and I, each other now, which is can. what I'm trying to do with you. I we don't can, come and say you're wild, wasting your life. I, I you, you did you not this I morning in our that. argument say, you know, you're wasting your life being I upset with me. And I apologize. What kind of bullshit is that? apologize and then i left the room i came back and you were still talking about it it was about 20 minutes later because you had it atoned <laughs> you hadn't confessed what is you do this for you? thing I apologize. you did not apologize you, i need to be you, like wa do i need so to wash your feet or something <laughs> and massage it was a your good back? start when you make a mistake ben let's say ben i don't know uh my then mistakes just work. don't bother me the way they bother you. Of course they don't. Of course they don't because they're your. My mistakes bother you. I not think, not the way that my mistakes bother you. That's because here's the thing, Ben. When I make a mistake, I own it. I say, you know what? I messed up. I put a whole segment in a show saying Amber was wrong. I make a whole big stink about it. I'm like, Ben, you know what? That was messed up, and I shouldn't have said that to you. This is how you apologize. You know, that was messed up, and I shouldn't have said that, but here's the thing. You shouldn't be upset about it because you're wasting your life being upset. There are so many other things I've done that's great, and I really don't even do that many bad things, so why are you even upset? That's what you do to me. That's what you do. So that that's what gets me that upset. That doesn't sound like a good person would should do that. 
Right. I don't think I should do that. If I don't think I do that in that kind of way with that kind of tone. And then you but walk if that's away. That's your perception. So all you got to do is, you know what? I fucked up. I apologize. I'm a doofus. How how can I be better the rest of the day? That's all you got to say. Even if you're faking it. <sighs> that's all you got to say. Pen, write this that's down. all you got to say. But you do this thing where you're like, "Hey, I messed up, but you're you're messing up even more by being mad at my mess up." Now that's some manipulative shit right there. My thing is I apologize to say, okay, let's correct the, the issue and let's move on. <laughs> but you're the issue. <laughs> you don't want to get corrected. So you make me the issue. If you got an issue, here's a tissue. That's fine. We, we clearly over it. <laughs> it's such a beautiful day outside. That's what you need to do. You're like, you know, I fucked up, but here's the thing. It's such a beautiful day outside. <laughs> so you don't have a ready, <laughs> like, you don't have a right that. to be angry. I'm like, what? Only be angry on rainy days is my philosophy. No, it's some evil shit that has gone down on the sunniest days of the year. Trust me. Trust me. Um, anyway, oh, I have here. Uh, I've been watching Legendary. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm sure we've told y'all this, but Ben's mom is staying with us. And this has been an absolute treat because, you know, we just don't get to hang out with her as much, at, at least not long term like this. And what happens is me and Ben's mom have been finding shows to watch, mostly shows that I watch. And then she gets interested in the show. So we've been bonding. So we were bonding over MTV's The Challenge, God, which, I, which Ben hated. Unbearable. I cannot be in the same room. Because I was a big that. MTV kid, so growing oh, up, I watched like The Gauntlet, horrific. The Inferno, Battle of Sexes. Shoot me now. Uh, oh. You know, The Duel. So I was watching The Challenge with your mom, which she loves. Not only does she love, she would look up what's going on with the characters outside, outside of the show, of oh, which is just, Jesus. I mean, we're kindred spirits in that way. And then we have been in been we've been binging ted lasso extra yep. heavy which I, we both I, love and i walk in crying too it's so beautiful i walk in i think it's really beautiful i just right now i just don't have time to watch or read anything because world con is coming up so i'm trying to read all the books that are up for the hugo so you ain't been watching nothing so you ain't been watching doctor I, who i i've watched a little you ain't bit been of watching doctor who uh, shadow and bone I did. Wa- you that, ain't been watching well, real I watched time. Alan Bone. Oh, this is all months ago before and, you had and the And last night you were like, why are you going to sleep? We got to watch Stranger Things. And yes. we binge Severance. Well, the, so stop Sever- trying to act so like these are, you just so been what, reading. So what do all those things have in common? They're all science fiction or fantasy. I know, which but is that's part of my job. Anyway. I'm just saying, you yeah. just try to make a statement like you're just this big elitist. Well, I, I'm well, not some elitist. Of us don't have time Ted, to watch Ted shows Lasso we've been reading. is brilliant. And, and by the way, I think Ted Lasso is straight from like a Terry Pratchett novel. If anybody's read Terry Pratchett, who's a fantasy author who really believes in the the power of being kind and the power of being decent, as he would say, like being, you know, following the golden rule. And a lot of his characters uh, eh, are not assholes. They're just they're, they people who consistently try to do the right thing and try to help others. And Ted Lasso reminds me a lot of that. It's a well, very we can't all show. be Ted Lasso. We can't. Yeah. <laughs> There's a level of. Um, but I do love Ted. And I think Ted Lasso himself would would recognize his positionality as a white man. He does. He does. Yeah. He, in the show, he does. Yeah. So it's it's. Great. I, I wasn't even calling to that. I'm just saying I, it's like the Michelle Obama thing. It's like. When we when they go low, we go yeah. high. It's like, well, we can't all be Michelle Obama, goddamn it. Some of us got to turn up. That's think, what makes the world fun a little bit. I think, I think uh, Terry Pratchett's response to that would be like, yeah, sometimes you go low and you need them in the balls, but once they're over, you, then you know, give them a hand up or something. Right. Terry Pratchett would like say, no, you should go low at times. Like, pl- fight Correct. dirty, fight dirty. Just one. But don't, time. but don't kick them when they're down. You know that type. Uh, of, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you, you you watch Ted Lasso and then Legendary. And yeah, we're watching Legendary about ballroom culture and you know the five elements of Vogue. Ben, what are the five elements of Vogue? Uh, Can you name hand, any of them? Because uh, yeah, so I do. I'll watch Legendary as well. I really like the horror, horror like horror, and then I like the anime one. But again, like, from this season, season from three this season, start, season yes. three, I really, really enjoyed um, the styles for that. There so are five like, elements hand, of Vogue. Hand performance, duck walk. <laughs> Okay. Uh, um, uh, what is the one where you just like prant, prant, prance? Uh, I'll, I'll give you that one. Catwalk. Catwalk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Catwalk. So hand, um, uh, duck, duck. Ham. Okay, you said cat, hands. Duck walk. Catwalk. Catwalk. Duck walk. Yep. You got uh, two more. Th- three. 
Um, two more. Dips. Oh, and good. Spins. Spins and dips. Yes. Yeah, spins Look at dips. you. Yeah. This is how much I watch the show. And you got one more. You're so close. Sp- oh, spins and dips is the same one. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, safe. Face. Is it face? Like no, that face? that is a category. I'm so proud of you. You're doing great. I, this is a voguing element. This isn't a category. You're doing great. It's is, floor performance. Oh, floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Floor work. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah. But your mom's been loving the show. But but I the thing is, me. I wasn't able... I mean, I, I can't... I wasn't able to name all of them off the top of my head, but I, I know enough of the show. I, I enjoy it. I just, again, like, I have... You can't appreciate like the sci-fi and fantasy elements of. No, I definitely can. I ballroom. Ju- it's like completely underground, created, and now it's just having almost. having this book club. I'm in another book club. I'm doing research and writing right now for, you know, lots of different things that you have to pick and choose, like the things that you you take in. And I do I do enjoy Legendary every time I watch it. I mean, with Meg gone, I I'm I feel a little bit <laughs> Not, less. Compelled. Oh, y'all on a first name basis. She's my favorite. Not human. Me, with Meg gone. With Meg gone. He, yeah, she's. You're referring to Meg the Stallion. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Meg the Stallion. Yep. You know, Megan. With, with Mega Ragon, it's been really hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I she, it, it's tough without having her there. But Kiki is filling her spot very yeah. well. Kiki's her own. Kiki Palmer's her own. You know, force yeah. in the game anyway. So yeah. But are you enjoying that your moms are doing the show? I love that my mom. You know, mom, you never would have thought she should have been more conservative. Yeah, she. It, it, little, and the show is very gay. Well, yeah. yeah. And she, it's she's gay. like, oh, she's judging them. She's like, oh, that that didn't they didn't really do floor performance because like, <laughs> <laughs> you know my mom is very competitive. She likes yeah. reality TV, and it makes sense that she likes this. And yeah, so it's she'll uh, be like the dips weren't that good. I'm like, go ahead, Judy. Wasn't she crying on Ted Lasso too? She yeah, was, there's yeah. some parts where both of us. I got a little misty at myself. I was like, that's Ooh. great. I that's just what, that's what comedy does. It'll. It'll chuckle, 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 and then once it has your attention, you're like, mm. and legendary is also b- built on comedy. Like the oh, yeah. the shadiness is very funny. It's Law Roach has been very mean. Sound off if you watch Legendary. Please sound off the Patreon because I'm a huge fan. But Law Roach has just been mean sometimes oh, really? this season. You Didn't he just get up and walk out out the room? No, Laomi did. Oh, Laomi did that. Leo- no, they've been wilding this year. But at one point, you remember Law was like, he's like, oh, I'm ordering something from Grubhub. Do you want yeah, anything? Yeah, Postmates. Yeah, Post like me. as somebody was performing. It's just like, come on, law. Come on, law. But yeah, speaking of uh, judging, somebody gave us a good review. Do you uh, want to read it? Yeah. Uh, so someone, love, uh, five-star re- review. This uh, person wrote, found them on TikTok. I'm 19. They don't know that I was actually their first child and somehow they lost me. <laughs> we'll stay loyal to my favorite parents who are so entertaining and lovely. Yellow star, 12, uh, one, two, three, five, seven. From Great Britain, uh, from five Great five Britain. nineteen, you know, twenty twenty two. You don't, you don't have to give the date. Oh yeah, but. <laughs> I don't have to give the date. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Uh, that was funny, but yeah, I actually we read are this. your parents. I read this and it it made me like a little emotional. I have to to realize that you know we're connecting with people from around the world across and, the pond, and yes. and with younger people as well. I think ultimately my goal is for people to read more and to laugh more and to be kinder people in general so it just felt really good to to reach out to someone and i don't know it, yeah i love connecting with people especially me misty eyed when they're uh, about a lot farther away i mean obviously i love connecting with people in chicago as well but i remember the other day on instagram somebody dm me and they're like just wanted you to know i'm i'm been loving following your journey and i'm so glad you had a healthy birth like love from sweden and i was like oh my gosh wow. yeah love it so sound off if you're from different corners of the world we'd love to see that i know i, I have a, a few followers from like trinidad and tobago as well so just just keep and and if you're from damn ohio we want to hear from you too so yeah we'd love to see I, it I, I think it's been really important for this podcast for us to explore science fiction and fantasy from uh, black creators uh, are throughout the world, um, those who have you know been affected by the African diaspora, from those who uh, are are creating science fiction within the context of you know their their African culture. Um, I don't know. It that's important for us to to watch things outside of 
just the American context because it, it is like we can, I think Americans can see themselves only within their context at times. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, all of us do, all of us do similar things to that, but yes, Americans for sure. Yeah. Because we don't really have, because our, we don't, our, our states are so large and big that you can drive miles and, you know, thousands of miles and not really run into a situation where you don't need to know like another language, right? You don't need to know to an extent, like another culture's different, um, you know, greetings or, or whatever, like cultural idiosyncrasies. Want to take a break? <laughs> no. Oh, oh yeah, we okay, have to do cool. patrons got a point. Oh, I was just it. I was just rambling. I'm probably gonna delete most of that. No, don't. No, I think it was Yeah, delete it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I think it was beautiful. Don't delete it. Don't delete it. Ben's well, been do, editing episodes, do, so do sometimes you feel, I'll cut. Do you feel like without a podcast, do you think we would have been reading or watching certain things like the Atlantics, right? It was uh sharing a very specific um, experience that was beyond the American context, like, right. Or yeah. Well, I, I, one don't think we would have been consistently doing that. So I just want to pat ourselves on the back for that. But even when this podcast started, I think one, I was shocked about how many works, I mean, truly it was just pure ignorance. I was shocked about how many black people were creators of science fiction and Mm -hmm. fantasy because I was never seeking out that genre and definitely not black authors. So I think that was a a great surprise, but to find out like just the sheer global impact of this genre, like a, what is it like globalization of this genre? We never would have thought that would happen. So, so in turn we've, we've ended up watching a lot of, you know, foreign films or foreign to us. And we've read a lot of like different actors, uh, different authors from Nigeria and from um, where was uh, Cadwell Turnbull from already? Oh my gosh. I'm just gonna say the Caribbean just I, I'm he's gonna kill me. Look, look it up again, but just different um, islands and different uh, St. Thomas. I just got it. Uh, just that, that that's really important that it's not just Amer- black American authors. It's authors from all over the world. So I just look forward to just, continuing to read about and learn about different people from all over the world now i'm rambling okay what were you about to say about the patrons oh yeah so you asked them a question if you and your partner boo thing spouse etc share household expenses how much is too much money to spend without consulting your partner he said what are we talking about this 100 dollars. yeah 500 dollars. maybe anything over a phone bill or maybe there's no limit we'd love to hear from you so yeah you were just asking about that and i, I forgot the context in which we were having an argument. Oh yeah, I bought a I I bought a couch. No, I bought a piece of furniture in the back room. The in the back chair. room mm-hmm. for the nursing chair, and without sort of your permission, I had halfway your permission. I wanted to buy a more expensive one. I wanted to buy one from like a local sh- store here, and the pricing would have been too much. It was outside the realm, uh, our budget. But I don't know. It was it was fun to read some of these. That a trend that I saw is a lot of people were making. This, you know, that this question, you know, depends on how much money you're making, right? Yeah. Like, that's a a huge thing. Why don't you read maybe like three this time? Or or Samantha wrote, this was interesting, depends if it's a $500 Costco bill, then no convo. But $500 on a new appliance or clothes, then yes to the convo, right? So if you're buying food, yeah, it's relative to what you're buying. Where some people were like, you know, they had specific prices, um... But again, those just like specific prices depends on like how much money you're bringing in, which yeah. is fair. Wait, read what um, Chanel said there. We take 80, 90 percent of our individual monthly earnings and put them toward our households. That covers mortgage, utilities, et cetera, as well as say, this person sounds like they have their shit together. Yeah. Like creating a budget is so critical. Well, you have to sit down and have these conversations. You do. You can't we, leave we things have. to chance. Yeah. I remember talking to my a family member. I'll say. And this family member was upset because their partner wasn't bringing in a lot of money or whatever. And, and I was like, well, before y'all moved in, did y'all talk about how things would be split evenly or whatever? And he's like, well, no, not really. And I'm like, well, people can't read your mind. You got to sort of splice this out, how it makes sense. And also you do have to make these things equitable. Like 
when Ben was in grad school, obviously he wasn't making as much as me because he was a, a student and I had a full time job at the time. So at the time, I probably made like what, like triple what you made at that time. So it, it wouldn't have made any yeah. sense for us to split things right down the middle. Yeah, triple. No. Would it have made sense for you to clean your own dishes? Yes. I, th- I but, think you were quadruple. Yeah. I think you were making quite Yes, but I should have maybe picked up the slack somewhere right. else. Right. But financially speaking, it wouldn't have made sense for us to split things down the middle. So it just depends on like what works for your household. In some households, one person does all of the financial, you know. Yeah. It is it, what it is. But, you know, I made a joke that you're you're my roommate. And I think you should have a roommate conversation with your spouse. Like, yeah. Like be like, all right, maybe maybe you should start even we should start doing that. Like, hey. I'm going to have a roommate conversation with you. All right, let's have one right now. What do you want to talk about? Is there something that uh, you've been wanting to bring up just uh, on a roommate level? I think now in front roommate, of everyone is the time. Uh, there are so many roommate conversations. But there are roommate conversations. There are spouse conversations. Yeah. And then there are parenting conversations. And yeah. if you could sort of bucket those, it could be helpful so that like, I'm going to have a roommate conversation. This has nothing to do with my attraction to you, whether we're banging tonight or not. I just need to talk some roommate shit with you. Yeah. And I don't want it to carry over into other, like, parts of our life. I like that. It's hard to do because yeah, those, all those identities we share, like, at the same time. And it becomes like, damn, I've been doing that a long time. So at what point <laughs> did you decide you're fed up? But, yeah, I just think, you know having just very intentional conversations about things is so important. I guess we've learned that in like therapy and, and other things because you're, you're my friend as well, but oh, when it, can when I have it a friend to, conversation is another one. Right. I'm just saying when it comes to you, we leave nothing to chance. Like I'm like, let me have a conversation right now with Ben about exactly how I want this thing. Like, well, I don't, yeah. you, you know, you ain't got to guess with me. I'm ready to talk. <laughs> like when you leave your like you know hair clippings in the sink i'm like hey let's talk right now like right now and you're like no i gotta go run first and i'm like that's fine anyway thank you patrons for sounding off about that now can we take a break yeah let's take a break thank you before we continue with the show i wanted to talk a little bit about noom Noom uses the latest in behavioral science to empower people to take control of their health for good. Through a combination of psychology, technology, and human coaching on their platform to help millions of users meet their personal health and wellness goals. A lot of people face pressures to change themselves, to fit other people's expectations, and the more freeing solution is to find things that work for you. Noom understands that everyone's weight loss journey is unique, and what works for someone else doesn't mean it'll work for you. That's why Noom's approach adapts to your lifestyle. It's flexible and it focuses on progress, not perfection, allowing you to work toward your goals at a pace that's comfortable for you. Noom Weight makes it easy to start your weight loss journey and stay on track with personalized lessons that help you gain confidence and practical knowledge, one-on-one coaching, and a cognitive behavioral approach that teaches you how to be mindful of your habits. 75% of Noom weight users finished the program and more than 60% of users that engage with the program kept the weight off for a year or more. So start building better habits for healthier long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash believe. Again, that's Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash believe. All right, so... Today we discussed and read. Today, no, we're not. We're discussing it now, but we read "Electric Arches" by Eve L. Ewing. Uh, Amber, poetry. Ugh. You hate poetry. I hate poetry. Right, which poetry. is weird because I write poetry a lot. I've wrote poetry for you. Yeah, I know. What do you do with the poems I write you? Do you keep them? Just try to put on a good face as you're reciting them. Like the ones that I've wrote for you, like, and I give them to you, like in the cards and stuff. Do you keep those? I read them and acknowledge them. Damn. Sometimes I take a picture of them. You wrote me some poetry at the beginning of our relationship, so I had to put on a good face then. And you were like, do you know the cry of a loon? <laughs> Which was some sort of like duck or something. I was okay, like, I was this writing. This white boy it. crazy as hell, but he cute. Like main. Ha- 
I didn't know you you hated until we read this book. I didn't know that you you weren't a fan of poetry. You knew I wasn't a fan of poetry. I didn't know that you were like, ugh. You know, it's funny because I, I enjoyed this book. Let's I be clear. It. We'll get there, but I, <laughs> in general, I would not like a night, a evening of poetry, which is what you would enjoy. I read an interview by uh, from Evel Ewing, and she writes, you know, I find that, you know, poetry already as an art form is something that people have a lot of, like, sort of mystified mythos about, where many people think of it as very inaccessible or very hard to understand, or they think that they need some kind of special training to understand it, like a class. It's confusing and so on. Which yeah. I th- yeah, so that's sort of your approach, and I think Eve... Yes, I Eve, think it can be a little convoluted. Yeah, and, and Eve... Um, to sort of combat that she made sure that in this book she includes like stories and uh you know pictures one of the pictures she creates is like a decoder for ring for idiots like me uh for <laughs> <laughs> she said so eve made sure she put pictures in there to make it more <laughs> digestible did you ever get one of those decoder rings from uh, the cereal boxes no i did not like like no, yeah. I've gotten like a prize at the bottom of well, a Cracker Jack box, but th- there's like a a scene in here, and I, I wouldn't have picked it up unless I read the uh, article. But she includes references to decoder ring for Black Girls Speak. I am not. Did you? Did you? Well, f- I mean, I know that the the Black Girls Speak was what she added to it, right? But I, yeah. I never got a decoder ring, and I ate a lot of Captain Crunch and the like as a kid. So yeah, you you still maybe do. Maybe Aaron like- stole the prize out the box. Yeah. Cap- oh, Captain, my Captain. Did, by the way, did you know that science fiction could be in poetry form? To that, uh, <sighs> two of my least favorite things combined <laughs> to make one big stupid thing. Um, but I, all, all jokes aside, this book is really great. This, <laughs> this collection of poetry, is it good. is good. There are definitely some poets, some po- poems. That's, I think poems. that's what they're called. Poems. There are definitely say say poem. Poem. You say it so much that the word stops losing meaning and poem, poem, poem. They there, do this in there, Ted Lasso. A, a yes, poem. A po- a, a, she's a, a poet laureate. I there are definitely some poems in here that I did not understand at all, and I tried to reread, and then I would just be like, you know what? Let me move on. I'm wasting my life. But there are some that I really enjoyed, and it, it and it was so. Obviously, the book was very authentically black. Like, the book didn't just have a black author. There were so many cultural staples in, uh, woven without the poems, like the pink luster oil. And the sh- there's one poem called Shea Butter Manifesto. So Eve did a very great job. I mean, obviously, she's brilliant. But she did an incredible job of just making things just a fully immersive black cultural experience. I know you didn't ask this yet, but one of my favorite things that Eve did was, let me show this to the YouTubers, baby. So there, um, there's this recurring retelling that Mm -hmm. Eve does throughout it. So I can show you right there. So you'll see a a poem like this one's called mother. Wait, no, another time a retelling. So what she would do with these is she would start with print like times new roman yeah. she would start a story with a printed version of it and then the second half of the story would be handwritten leaving you to assume that that was maybe made up or or not yeah. so one of the retellings was about like the first time she was called the n-word mm-hmm. and so the back end of the story is like wow did this thing happen was this her response or was this just the imagined part i'm assuming it's imagined because this is a sci-fi it, fantasy it, text but that was really great because i was like it, it allowed me to, as a black person, think back to like, when, when was the first time I was called the N word or recognized discrimination? And what would have maybe been, what was my actual response versus what was my imagined response? So I, I really loved those uh, decisions that she made. Go ahead. Yeah. And so the conclusions for these are so fantastical and mystical. Like this woman calls. Eve, uh, presumably Eve, the N word as a little girl, and then Eve goes home and gets her flying bicycle and scoops her up. And this, the woman who mm-hmm. called her the N word, in this huge net and drops her into Lake Michigan on a rock in the middle of nowhere. It's just like, yeah, it, it's so powerful. But I think what this does is shows this the power of fantasy, where ex- as a genre, we're able to go back and um, reimagine the world without the pain 
right? Like, yes. um, and, and it, it's empowering. And Tanana Du, who writes the foreword to this, said, like, reading this book made me realize, like, why I write fiction. Yeah. And and the power of fiction, not only fiction particularly, but fantasy. And Tanana Du is a fantasy horror writer. And, and there's so much of that element. One of the really, like, big themes throughout this is time and this idea of going back in time. And so she writes a time travel story with LeBron James in it, LeBron you know? <laughs> and it was, it was just very fan, like, oh, and LeBron James, you know, because LeBron James' mother, very similar to, um, you know, Richard, you know, Richard Williams, um, moved for LeBron James so he could get better coaching. And LeBron James goes back in time and just, is like looking at his younger self and telling his younger self, like, you got this, you're, you're going to be successful in all those kinds of things. And so fusing those, those elements together, I think are like very beautiful. And there's lots of that throughout here. Yeah. And it wasn't just, it, it was the perfect balance of black, like a, on, on a spectrum of black tragedy to black joy, there were tick marks throughout the whole spectrum where sometimes it's like, well, if all this author did was turn tragedy, you know, rags into riches, like we've seen that a million times, but like Ben just pointed out, there's this like LeBron James storytelling, but also I just said the first time someone's called the N word on the sort of like black sadness, but then there's the, the shea butter and the pink hair oil, like just daily black isms. There's some Erica Badu stuff in here there's uh one of my favorite pieces is about Zora Neale Hurston well it's not about Zora Neale Hurston it's it is a poem that has taken a quote from Zora Neale Hurston and then the 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 story has expanded from there uh can I see that real quick damn she did a good job with this yeah I it's it's those parts that I think are are really powerful do I understand you know poetry is so much about like this rhythm and slant rhymes and iambic pentameter and all that. So I, I don't, I wasn't really much for that. Like, I, I don't know if she did that effectively or not, but I enjoyed the, the narrative storytelling. Like, you know, you write poetry, like what is, I feel like there's like rules of poetry, but that only yeah. poets understand. That's, uh, or people who study poetry, English professors and they, well, you they know, wouldn't call themselves poets, English professors who study poetry. No. Who's a poet then? A poet is someone who writes poems. So, professors. Everybody who writes have a, ostensibly wrote poems, right? No, most professors probably have not wrote poems that has studied so it? that study it. Oh, yeah, like like Ooh, English professors. Poem. I mean, the English professor. I mean, probably at some point they wrote a poem for sure, but I wouldn't. Cons- they probably don't consider them the, themselves. That would be in the creative writing. Would so, you consider yourself a poet? Uh, yeah. Are you a poet Unpublished. if you write one poem? That's a great question. Are you a artist if you draw one drawing as a kid? No. You know, my friend who's a professional artist, he would say, yeah. One time I said, oh, you know, I'm a drawer. And he's like, you don't, <laughs> he's so in a very typical fashion of him. He's like, you don't put clothes in yourself. You can't be a drawer. I'm like, I'm not an artist. I draw. I just draw. I'm a drawer. You know, a drawer. He was making a pun on a drawer. Oh. Drawer. Did you laugh at that joke? I thought it was funny. Hmm. Well. <laughs> you know, you know, I I could see it's slightly amusing. Uh this Zora Neil Hurston quote. So it, the quote is really simple. It says, no, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. So then Evel Ewing writes a poem called What I Mean When I Say I'm Sharpening My Oyster Knife. Um, and I still kind of don't completely understand the poem, but I, some key things that stick out to me is like one line said, what, what I mean is I'll eat you alive, slipping the blade in sideways, cutting nothing because the space was always there. So, I mean, there and there's lots of great stuff in here, but I just love this idea of like, I'm having a good time being a rich bitch, but I will eat you alive, bitch. And also this idea of creating your own space or finding that space that was already there for you. What do you mean? I think like a lot of, especially oh, as a black you woman, shuck that. 
yeah open to yeah create, but but yeah. you're not even cutting there was already a space there and you're just putting the knife in and opening and it and expanding it yeah see this is why i don't like poetry because that was a way better i just like the I, the image of eating whoever the fuck is in the shell alive but that's poetry is that you get to take out of it what you want that's the beauty like poetry is there's this idea i think where people have to like i get like this was the purpose of the poem and if i don't get that purpose then i fucked up in reality you get to create your own purpose or you get to respond to that own poem and how you're feeling uh and i think this this collection does it really really well the other thing is that there is this beautiful poem where she writes about going to navy pier with her father Mm -hmm. and she writes about old navy pier and i remember i think i came here she's from chicago yeah she's she's a chicago writer and so in 2007 we gotta reach out yeah uh in 2007 i went to navy pier and it was very very different and it probably she, you know, growing up here in the 90s, she she says in the poem, it was also very, very different. And it was just fascinating to hear her write so beautifully about Chicago. And us being from Chicago, we love this city. And in an interview, she she mentions about how when people talk about Chicago, specifically in the age of Trump, uh, it was sort of seen in this place of like pure villainy. And her, and she you know see she's a sociologist she's known for writing a a really important book called um ghosts in the schoolyard about the closing of what the 52 schools or whatever that rom emmanuel closed anyway a great book everyone should read it but she writes about how oftentimes when you talk bad about a group of people whether it be you know the the crack babies of the 80s or you talk about the gun violence of chicago that they <laughs> There was no desire to help this problem. Right. Usually, it's a precursor that Eve points out. Uh, Doctor e, Doctor Ewing, she's a doctor. She yeah, points tripping. out. She points out that you do this right before you justify using a, an exorbitant amount of force. Mm-hmm. It's like you're gonna say, "Look at all these terrible people." Okay, now it's we're like justified. The George Ford riots now now like, we're look just at all these people looting, and mm-hmm. now we're justified in in responding violently. And it was just mm. such a fat. I mean, everyone should read this hard. This uh, interview, I'll, I'll make sure I include it yeah. uh, through the the interceptor. And it was so poignant to be like, yeah, when people start to really tear down somebody, it's it is the precedent for a violent act towards that person. And she was, you know, mentioning specifically how people talk about Chicago and what she does. I think is. She both celebrates Chicago, but also points out some of the really sad things. And one of these, she writes about the death of a a very beloved man in this city um, from Pilsen. He was murdered Mm -hmm. at a a bar that Amber and I have been to many times. Um, He knew two of our friends who actually had a a store right next to this bar. And this man was murdered. He was an artist. He you can go see some of his work that he framed he was a framer and he framed a lot of pictures that are up in the mexican um uh museum of art in chicago Mm -hmm. everyone should go to that museum it's stunning and she writes a poem about his death it was so tragic yeah his name was rudy rudy it was awful it was so yeah it was so 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 sad and um she writes about this sadness but it was within a context of pilsen which is a beautiful neighborhood and and the bar is a great freaking bar and um the the shops around there are really awesome it, you know there's a yeah i, I don't want to i don't want to deter people from going to this bar so i'm, I'm not she i think she mentions it in the poem but there's this balance right of like recognizing there is a lot of tragedy in chicago and but there's also a lot of things to celebrate as well and i think that she finds the balance when she's writing about chicago in a way that other people may not. I think, um, and moving on to some of her other works that were really just like, damn, kill that shit. Uh, The the story called The Device was Mm. one of our favorites. You want to do a quick plot? Why don't you do it? You do it. Okay, well, I'm going to do it, but if I forget a an element to the story. Can you just not cut me off? Just, Just let me... You got this. Let me drown the ship and then you can save us. Okay, well, the, the long and short of it is there is this um, 
little girl and then there's this adventure almost sort of like this invention convention right so people are there to see these products that have been invented and there's this one huge big uh device that is being activated and once this device is activated we learn that this device is basically the the ancestors it's it's you know it's like you turn on uh, Frankenstein. No, it's not Dr. Frankenstein. You turn on what has been created and you have been brought to life and you're talking to the ancestors from the past. So obviously this little girl then asks this big box, like, I, I want to get this right. So stall for me, would you? Oh, I get yeah, it. Yeah. So this device was actually created by only black engineers Correct. and inventors. Correct. And she starts the story with a reference that this isn't just a, a, George a project. George Washington Carver, peanut butter. Yeah, this is not a singular. It was open source. The people who were able to access it was a unified front. And it wasn't just a single black creator who was sort of picked out, you know, by um, a group of people or, or whatever. She's, she's recognizing that this was a shared endeavor by a group of black scientists correct and so this little girl then says to this big device like hello please stay calm this is not god or a dream and you are not going crazy i'm talking to you for many years in the future i'm using the device built by colored people of this country um so she says that she says the word color but you know this device might have been from years ago so that might be the only thing it understands so this little girl is basically it's like saying like hey we've built you big machine um and you've been built by black people i'm your great 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 granddaughter and then the little girl looks down at this paper that she's reading from to say to the machine like what words can you offer us to help us be free as black people in a world that does not love us so she's asking this machine that has brought the spirit of the past back saying like, how can you help us black people now live free in this world? And the machine responds by just laughing. Yeah. So what did I forget? Now, now come out. The machine is a conduit in which you can project information into the minds of the ancestors. Yeah. Simple. Right. So <laughs> she, so she, she's not talking, the de- she's not talking to the device She's talking to an ancestor who was a slave yeah. who's like working out in the field that day who all, who suddenly hears a voice in her head. Mm. And that's what the device is allowing this little girl to do. Got it, got yeah, it, Yeah, yeah. So she, it's almost like, she, and um, I, I was in the interview, she talks about this story and she said, yeah. uh, you know, we as, referring to black folk uh, and her specifically, is that we sort of look at our ancestors as um the knowers of all the knowers of all information in reality they had personalities uh they were struggling day to day uh and this um the response of just laughter is that question would seem so absurd because to an ancestor who is enslaved there is nothing you could possibly say or do to make a world stop hating you like why it's almost it almost became like, why would you look back to your ancestors for this answer when they were just trying to f- gain their basic freedoms? Yeah. And that sort of became like a reflection. It is a haunting, chilling piece. Uh, yes. If, you could, if you're like, I only have time to read one poem from this book, I, I would highly recommend reading the device. Oh, it's so, it's really good. It's like, it's, it's also fun, just as a comedian in general, I saw this, uh, I saw this TikTok this week. I will try to find it or share it with you at one point. And it was like... And this could all be a lie, but there's something about like slave humor that I really love. Slave humor created by black people that I really love. I, I want to preface by saying that like, you know, any sketches that like Dave Chappelle would do with like Jim Crow and stuff like that were always funny pieces. But somebody on TikTok found this air quote fact that Harriet Tubman used to have to like knock babies out if they were like going, <laughs> escaping, uh, you know, to the North for freedom or something like that. And so obviously this TikTok creator did a reenactment of Harriet Tubman, just like punching a baby. I know, I know it's a thing. It's, is it cringy? Sure. But it's, it it just brought like, it's just funny. I'll have to put it. This sounds like something that maybe you need to talk to like 
your group of black friends maybe not to me right you have maybe a black not night. to you yeah amber has maybe, maybe you, amber you haven't had a black night in a while I where, where amber just has usually <laughs> i don't uh, call it her, that or or oh maybe sometimes yeah, I'm like, I'll be, i need to go hang out with some black people tonight <laughs> yeah like i've been around your white ass all day or two lines yeah so no it's awesome. it's a reality yeah you but know no, I, it's funny it's it's if i drop the video in there it's funny or like remember the time where this like white person made this funny joke and all these black people laughed and this one black girl was like, "What? Well, yes, this is funny, but slavery. And everybody was like, oh. you know, so. Can, can we just for a moment, right? That, yes. That's just, what, yes. It, can we just it was a video and, uh, that did that. It, and because we do think about going back to this story, we do think about our ancestors as just like, Poor this, poor that, woe is me, this is horrible, just everyday tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. And it's it's nice sometimes to just sit and think like our ancestors were just people with with personalities, with I mean, obviously they were hopeless like we all are now, but they you know, some wanted to escape, some did it, some were comedians, some weren't. It's like so there's some element of of humanity that is brought to slavery when I think about this. I know it's cringy, but it it I, I'll go find the TikTok. You'll be like you'll you'll slightly chuckle. No, no yeah, and I, w- I will tell no one that you chuckle. Yeah, to please don't. Yeah, I think that's part of the reason why Dave Chappelle stopped doing the Dave Chappelle show. He was making jokes, uh, and I think he just saw some white people laughing too hard. Yeah, and I think he stopped doing that. Um, it, reading this, I forgot. I think there was one scene where she talks about going to a therapist meeting with a therapist Mm -hmm. and uh at this point it was through reading this book i had this realization that there's this idea that if you read black authors that somehow makes you less racist or something Mm. you know like sometimes i think white people have this feeling at times like oh you know i read i read you know how to be an anti-racist or i read um octavia butler or i've read this or that book it's like and even ted cruz read anti-racist baby he, he did read anti-racist <laughs> or, baby. Or some parts of it some pages. So, I, and i was thinking like if if that's your takeaway like my thought is if you're only if you're if you're reading only black authors and mostly black authors you should actually be leaving feeling more racist true as a white person and if you're not feeling more racist as a white person when you're done reading a book like electric arches um go ahead read it again and maybe maybe you 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 need to do some more self-reflecting i don't know reading this made me um just have that realization were there parts where you felt uncomfortable i didn't feel uncomfortable i just was like oh uh, yeah for sure Hmm. um for example uh coco taylor there's this oh, she yeah. she has this myth making of Coco Taylor who stole, you know, John Henry's hammer and turned it into a necklace. And I was like, I've never heard of Coco Taylor. Me either. Yeah. I looked it up after this and I, and it was um Coco Taylor is this blues musician who's pr- pretty a much person. a legend, a, yeah. a legend who I didn't know anything about. Um and at one point in the story, Evel Ewing says Coco Taylor was a ghostwriter for 17 songs that the Beatles produced or, yep. la- or later are credited for. And I was just like, see, this is the shit. This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed that. And also, or like the Malice at the Palace stuff. Yep. She wrote a piece uh, about that. Meta, meta World Peace, which for those who don't uh, know, um, Malice at the Palace is a Netflix documentary, but there was a big fight that and you know all the indiana pacers were suspended and this was actually one of the only years that the indiana pacers had a team that probably would have made it to the nba finals and and probably would have won but it happened so early in the season they were i think suspended for 116 games yeah anyway it was a huge brawl but she writes a poem about this and this idea that if someone throws a soda can at you like y- fuck I don't them up. fuck Going them back up to Michelle Obama or just, like, just go low <laughs> or just this idea that basketball players because they make millions of dollars that they're not allowed to get mad at you it, it became this whole conversation afterwards but I remember you said they were called like thugs yeah it was like these shit. were thugs but then when hockey players 
you know, throw off their gloves and start beating the shit out of each other. Baseball. Right. Too. Baseball. Or when these tennis players, I read an article in the Washington Post recently, slamming their rackets down, their rackets go flying into the stands, almost hitting kids, you know, and we don't call them thugs. Right. And it no. was, it just, I think this moment and the after effects of this moment and the response to this moment, um, showed the racism that exists even with the upper es- echelons of our society, right? Basketball players making millions of dollars. And uh, it was just, it was but a they're very... they're black first. Mm-hmm. They're black first. And I thought that was something that she sort of tackles um, a little bit in here. One oh, of fouls. the... Mm-hmm. One of the other... Uh, <laughs> Bad joke. Yeah. The first poem she... T- <laughs> the first poem she talks about is how when aliens, if they were to come to Earth because black culture and black music and and black dance and all of it is so such a big part that if aliens were to come to the u.s that they would mostly just know about u.s culture through black creation yeah unless they went to walmart and saw the juneteenth napkins that said it's the freedom for me they would be quite confused (laughs) unless they tasted that juneteenth ice cream who's gonna get fired for that Maybe it's, I hope it's not like some young black intern who was like, oh, you know, or like I can see Walmart being like, hey, here's some black creatives. Can you come up with something like this? You know? No, I, I just cannot believe a black person was like Juneteenth ice cream. Like, what does it taste like? Blood and metal? I want to know who came up with these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but if the aliens didn't go to Walmart, yes, everything else would be. You liked uh, the poem about black hair, right? The yeah. the personification about black yes. hair and how it defies gravity. That's yeah. Uh, the hair is actually the electric arches, right? Yeah, I think that's what it, it could be. What she's referring to. I think it is. Wait, give me the book real quick, since we got like that's right. a couple right over there, right over where uh, behind your computer. Yeah, there you go. Okay, this is the last thing I'm going to say. I'm, I'm not sure about Ben, but. I think, you know how you go through a book and you're like, where's the title of the book? Stall, Ben, stall. Yeah, uh, everyone should read this. It's gotten like great, great reviews. Uh, Tracy K. Smith, who wrote a collection of poems um, called Life on Mars, is also this like beautiful fusion of science fiction and David Bowie and fantasy and all of that. Uh, she she gave the book a, a great review and actually that was part of the reasons i originally saw this i was like oh i i've read tracy k smith uh this book would be awesome to read i think like for teachers as well there are like individual poems you could really use and very accessible um some of them some of the poems deserve one or two readings maybe three readings uh, also, she's going to be here at Worldcon. She's the guest of honor in Chicago for Wor- Worldcon, um, and you can, you know, read her work on Ironheart, which is uh, a, the Marvel superhero. So she's doing like lots of dope, awesome stuff. But I think this was w- one of her first science fiction works that really brought her, um, her attention to the fantasy science fiction community. Damn, I can't find it. I'll find is it, it later. Ode to Luster Pink? No, I, I remember it being on the right side of the book. Oh, I think of that way too sometimes too. Oh, <laughs> one of my, my, there's a great line where she writes about comic books, the origin story of her parents. She writes, love is like a comic book. It's fragile and the best we can do is protect it in whatever clumsy ways we can. Plastic and cardboard, dark rooms and boxes. Man, so beautiful. Our love is is actually pretty fragile, too. Uh, I mean, yeah, it says a love like that doesn't last, but it has a good ending. What's our ending going? I mean, it doesn't last. If you consider love in general between two humans can't really last more than 80 years, right? You know, you have your sweetheart, maybe you meet nine years old. It can last as long as one person doesn't drop the other person's breast milk. It can last. <laughs> First of all, you handed that to me when I was still sleeping, and I—I like, I was damn I had near a dream, too. and it. I, <sighs> well, Ben. With that being said, why don't you warp up the show? In conclusion, uh, 
read Electric Arches. It's a beautiful collection of poems and visual art and short stories and just makes you feel really pensive, but also cozy, but also sad, but also happy. Gives you all the emotions. Thanks, Ben. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for listening, listening to another episode of the Sci-Fi Sci-Fi Podcast. Up next, we will be reading The Memory Librarian by Janelle, Janelle Monet, but it was also co-written by many authors that we discussed on the show, like Eve L. Ewing, that we discussed, Danny Lore, Alana Don Johnson, Johanka Delgado, and Sheree Renee Thomas. It's a short read, y'all, but we're going to be discussing this and much more. You can also check it out on Audible. We will see y'all next week for the show. Bye, y'all.